Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save than thou art. Thou my best thought, my day. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the Word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth Chapter 3, It is Written Again Chapter 4, Includes Study Aids Chapter 5, Gives a Suggested Bible Study Program Our guide is a primer a beginning point that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. How do we determine what we may do or what we are obligated to do in religious matters? You know, there's all kinds of answers that you may get if you go out and you ask people about this. There are many people who are going to say, well, in religious matters, you can do what you want to do as long as it's not specifically forbidden. So as long as there's a thou shalt not, you're good to go, and you can do what you want to do. There are others who will say, well, as long as you do it in the name of Jesus and it's sincere, then it's okay to do. You just you follow your heart, if you will. And there are some people who set all that aside and say, do whatever you want. doesn't really matter, as long as it feels good to you. Um, there's a lot of that more and more creeping into our culture, especially in the younger generations as they have been taught this pluralism and cultural pluralism and everybody's right, everybody um, is equally valid, everybody's view, everybody's religion, everybody's beliefs are equally valid. Well, as someone who looks to the Bible as God's Word, as someone who would consider Jesus is the Christ. Do you believe that in religious matters, we can do whatever we want to do? That we just determine, we just decide what we want or what pleases us, and that's acceptable to God? Or is there another way to establish what's right, what's wrong?
Is there another way, in other words, to establish biblical authority? Well, if you recall in Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and following there, Jesus gives the what we sometimes call the Great Commission to his apostles. But in 28, 18, as he gives this to them, this is what he tells them. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So all authority is given to Jesus in heaven and on earth. So that means he sets the rules. He determines what's right and wrong. Not you and I, but he does because he is the Son of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23, it says that God made him head over all things to the church, which is his body. So he's the head of the church. As the head, he has the right to direct the church and tell the church what to do. He is king of kings and lord of lords, according to 1 Timothy 6, verse 15. Well, if he's king of kings and lord of lords, he's master of all. He has authority over all. And that means he is the one who decides what we are to do in our lives, including, if you will, religious matters, uh, which may be too narrow of a term, but everything in our life, the Lord has authority over that. But when we think about church, when we think about worship, when we think about the organization of the church, when it, we think about the plan of salvation, when we think about all these different things, who is it that decides and determines what is right and then also, therefore, what is wrong? The answer the Bible gives us is the Lord Jesus Christ has that authority. Now, something I want us to notice in Matthew chapter uh, 21, Matthew chapter 21, is that Jesus talks about this with the Jews. In Matthew chapter 21, we're just going to read this here very briefly, and then we'll come back and dig in it a little bit further. But Matthew chapter 21, verse 23, uh, Jesus says this, or this is the exchange between Jesus and the Jews who are with him there. It says, now, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And we read that right now just to establish this fact. That authority is important. Authority is a biblical issue, of course. Authority was discussed and debated between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. And so this is an important subject for us to study and to look at, to understand what is it that the Bible teaches about authority, about how to establish authority. And in this first lesson, what we're going to notice is, as it's discussed here, authority is either from heaven or it's from men. And so we need to understand where our authority comes from and where we need to turn in order to establish authority in our religious beliefs and practices. So we're going to come back in just a moment. We're going to go through this account and dig deeper into the idea of authority being either from heaven or from men. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. 
Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Let's continue our study now on authority, whether it's from heaven or from men, and how to establish authority. As we look in Matthew chapter 21, we want to recall what's happening here uh, before the verses that we want to really focus on in just a moment in verses 23 down to 27. But in Matthew chapter 21, what you have here is the Jewish leaders are upset about Jesus, of course, what he's teaching and what he's doing. Remember, if you will, in verses 12 and following there is when Jesus went into the temple and he cleansed the temple and he drove out the money changers and those who bought and sold doves and things like that. And so this is the next day in Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 and following. Jesus shows back up at the temple and they come and they confront him about what he is doing here. So let's read these verses again. Matthew 21, verses 23 to 27. Now, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So two questions come up. When they confront Jesus, they ask him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? So they are challenging him to say, you know, you need to tell us, is it scripture? Is there something in the law of Moses that gives you, Jesus of Nazareth, the right to come in here and to do these things? Is there some kind of tradition of which we are unaware, some type of tradition of the elders that that you think you have a right to come here and do these things? Do do you have some type of prophetic office that gives you the right, the authority to come in? You know, just where is it uh, that you find this authority? By what authority? What what is the um, basis of the authority? Then they ask this other question, who gave you this authority? So where's the source of the authority And then who is it that gave you this authority? Did God give it to you? Did you just take it on yourself? Is the authority inherent within you? Uh, Did the council, did the Jewish council give it to you? Did the priest, did did somebody among the priest uh, give you that authority? Just who gave you this authority? Who said you could come in and do all these things in the temple, you know, cleanse the temple, come in and do your teaching and denounce us, all those things that he'd been doing that was absolutely driving them crazy. By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? Now, it's very interesting to note that when Jesus responds, he doesn't say, I don't need authority. It doesn't matter what authority. It doesn't matter Who gave me this authority? Now, Jesus accepted their challenges based in a legitimate concept. Yeah, you need to have authority and you need to have it from the right source. Yes, you need those things. Jesus has simply turned it on them to test their integrity. Well, I'll answer you if you'll answer this question for me. And so he turned it around to test them. He wasn't saying your questions are illegitimate. He's saying your character is corrupt. 
is how he's dealing with this. So be that as it may, he turns it around and he says, okay, here's what I want to know. I want to know the baptism of John. Where was it from? Was it from heaven or was it from men? So one of the things we understand in this is when they respond, they say, well, if we say from heaven, then he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? And what they're, what the Lord is driving at and what they understand he's driving at is, of course, they, they should have been baptized by John. They should have submitted to John's baptism because it was from heaven. But what they're really getting at, why did you not believe him? What did John say? John pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what he's driving at. Well, if the baptism of John is from heaven, so he's sin of heaven, he's authorized by heaven, God is, is ordaining his teaching, then why didn't you believe him when he said, I am the Savior, I am the Messiah? That's the problem they're dealing with here. But then they say, well, we say from men, which was an illegitimate source of authority because they say, well, all count John as a prophet. <laughs> and we say he, he just did it by the authority of men. The people are going to get upset and they're going to attack us and turn against us. And so they say, we don't know. They knew, of course, they knew exactly where John's authority came from but they were unwilling to answer that question. And so Jesus refused to answer that question as well, their question. He doesn't say the question's illegitimate. He's saying your integrity is lacking. And so I'm not going to answer you in this matter, in this question. So Jesus, because Jesus said, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. So we understand that authority is a subject that the Lord believe was important. It's just on this occasion, he did not deal with it because these men would not answer the question on John's authority. And so we're going to come back in a minute and, and dig down a little bit deeper into what is it that's being revealed here about authority being from heaven or being from men. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. We invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. When we think about authority and what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 21, we understand that it, he establishes there are only two sources of authority. It's either from heaven or from men. Again, Matthew chapter 21, verse 25, the baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? Authority has to come from some source, from some place. And the Lord breaks down religious authority into two categories, either authority of heaven, that is from God, or authority of men, which is, of course, illegitimate. It's not right. And so authority from heaven let's understand, is what we need in our religious beliefs and practices. And that authority is only found in the Word of God. When we go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, you remember what it says there? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. The idea that the scripture is given by inspiration of God is an idea of literally God breathed, that God gave the scripture, that he revealed his truth to men. And we are to follow that. It says it is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, how we are to live our lives. 
both individually and collectively, if we are disciples of Christ, it is found in the Word of God, and it is complete, and it supplies us, it equips us for every good work. There's not a good work that's not in the Word of God. If it's not in the Word of God, it doesn't fit that definition, right? So here is the Word of God that has with it the authority from heaven. In Acts chapter 26, verses 24 and 25, as the Apostle Paul is giving a defense of his work, of his labors and teaching, he says that he was speaking the truth of God's word. As he's on trial here, it says, now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad because he had been talking about the fact that he had seen Jesus on the road to Damascus and he was sent to the Gentiles and all of that. And so Festus thinks Paul's gone crazy and he cries out. He blurts that out to Paul. But notice what Paul answers, Acts 26, 25. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. The word of God is truth and reason. That truth has authority with it. It's not irrational, but it is rational. And so we have this word that is to be believed and it is to be obeyed. We're to follow this word of God. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, if you notice this with me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to obey that gospel, that gospel that Paul taught, the gospel that John taught, that Matthew taught, that other disciples taught, that was has been revealed in the New Testament, that word of truth and reason. We are to believe it and we are to obey it because it has the authority of heaven behind it. And let's understand that it is the entirety of the New Testament, that this authority is in what we call the New Testament or the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. It's not in the Old Testament. Because notice this, in Matthew chapter 17, We don't have time to go through the entire account, but read it sometime. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 13. Jesus goes up on what's called the Mount of Transfiguration. He goes up and he's transfigured. Peter, James, and John are with him. And as he's transfigured and he's having a conversation, Luke tells us, with Moses and Elijah, that Peter, James, and John come around. They wake up when this is happening. And here's what it says in Matthew 17, verse 4. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So you had... Moses and Elijah there, and Jesus, and they're having a conversation. Peter sees this, and he says, I want to make a tabernacle for each of you. Then a cloud overshadows them, and God the Father speaks and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I will please hear him. Not Moses, not Elijah. Listen to Jesus. The law, Moses. The prophets, Elijah. See, Moses and Elijah, they, they were actually there. This isn't a, um, a fantasy account or just a made-up tale, but they were actually there, but they represent the law and the prophets. 
And when Peter attempts to honor all three of them as like being equal, God the Father steps in and says, no, you listen to my son. Don't follow the law and the prophets. Don't follow Moses and Elijah. They're not on equality with Jesus. You follow Jesus. You follow his teaching, his will. You follow that new covenant. So we understand that that new covenant has been established and there has been a change of the law. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 12 to 14 talks about. Now go to John chapter 16. John 16. And just notice what the Lord says to his apostles in John 16 verse 13. It says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So here in John 16, 13 to 15, you have this chain of authority and this chain of revelation. You have God the Father who has given a charge and authority to Jesus Christ, who sends the Holy Spirit to reveal all truth to the apostles. So from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit to the apostles who would be guided into all all truth, not some truth, not partial truth, not most of the truth even, but into all truth. So those apostles were guided into all truth in the first century. And that means that what they revealed, what we have in the New Testament, is from heaven. It's the authority of Jesus Christ, the authority of heaven. So we look to the word of God for our authority Authority from heaven is found in the word of God, and we are not to add to it or to take from it. If you go to the book of Revelation as the New Testament is closing out in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, this is what the apostle John writes down. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Don't add to it and don't take from it. We have no right. If all authority is in Jesus... And what he has revealed is complete, as we mentioned a while ago, then we have no right to add to it or take from it. It has no need for addition, and it has no need for subtraction. And if we try to alter it, we are accursed. We are condemned, as Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says. Galatians 1, 8 and 9, where the apostle writes this, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. We can't add to it. We can't take from it because we'll be condemned. You know, just like in the New Testament, there are people who tried to add circumcision And they are condemned for that. They are rebuked for that. That's revealed as false doctrine, false teaching, and a soul-damning thing. Then there are others called Gnostics who tried to take away the incarnation, tried to say that God had not come in the flesh. As the New Testament teaches, Jesus was God in the flesh. They tried to say that hadn't happened. So they tried to take away from the gospel. And they are condemned and rebuked for that. They are described as false teachers. So we understand we can't add to, we cannot take from the word of God. Our authority, legitimate authority, is found in the word of God. That's the authority that comes from heaven, and there is no other. We'll come back in just a moment and study some more on the idea of authority from heaven, 
or from men. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. As we continue to think about authority, authority from heaven versus authority from men, we are at the point of looking at authority from men. Let's understand that authority from men is of course, not biblical. In fact, it is pagan. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, in the Old Testament, it's worded like this. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. So you and I don't have the ability, let alone the authority, to direct our own steps. We don't decide what's right and wrong, what's acceptable and pleasing to God, and what's not acceptable and displeasing to God. In Proverbs 14, verse 12, Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You know, there are so many things that people think are right. It feels good to them. It seems logical to them. It's pleasing to them, but it's the way of death. You just look at the world, and I'm convinced that if you will look in the religious world around you today and see how far out people are getting with their religious beliefs and practices, and you'll recognize, man, something's not right. It's because people are following their own authority. They're following that way of death instead of the way of truth. Let's understand that authority in biblical matters is not ecclesiastical authority. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and what we're saying here is not ecclesiastical. That's the idea. It's, it's not like religious leaders can get together and say, hey, here's the right thing to do. That's not where authority comes from. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, the Apostle Paul is writing about those who are out teaching among Christians, and he says this, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. You see, in the first century, there were people who were out there and presenting themselves as representatives of Christ, ambassadors for Christ. But he says, these are false apostles, deceitful workers. And he says, don't be shocked that that's happening, that they're presenting themselves in this way because Satan presents himself as an angel of light. He disguises who he really is and what his real agenda is. And so don't be surprised if people come along and say they represent Christ and say, oh, the Lord will approve it. The Lord is endorsing this. The Lord is behind this. When in fact, it's not the Lord, it's Satan. Because he says, these false apostles, these deceitful workers, transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. You see, there are religious people who you look at them and you think, well, that is a man of God. But they're not because they're not teaching what the Word of God says. They don't have the authority of heaven. They are going by the authority of men. So it's not an ecclesiastical authority. You know, there's a lot of people who think that authority in religion is ecclesiastical in nature, that it comes from a, a body of religious men. Uh, one of the greatest examples is the Roman Catholic Church and how they look to the Pope and to the archbishops and cardinals and all of that. And they say, well, well, those men 
They, they determine what's right and wrong. No, they don't determine what's right and wrong. And the, the entire uh, body of believers does not determine what's right and wrong. We, we don't get together and vote and decide, hey, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. No, truth is established by God, not by man. So there's no counsel that can establish truth. There's no convention, whether it's a Southern convention, a Northern convention, an East or West convention, it doesn't matter. There's no congregation. There's no church that can establish truth. Because men do not establish truth. Only God establishes truth. There's no creed that men can come up with. You know, there's so many who have tried to write down and say, well, here's the definitive right and wrong, or here's the definitive way to worship. And, and they've tried to do that in their own declarations, their own creeds. In 2 John verses 9 through 11, notice what it says here. 2 John verse 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. He who does not abide in the doctrine of Christ. That doctrine of Christ is revealed in the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. That doctrine's revealed, his doctrine, his teachings are revealed in the New Testament. And that's what we're to go by, not by the teachings of men, not by the creeds of men, not by something like the Book of Mormon. You know, Joseph Smith and some of his successors after him uh, have come up with this idea of the Book of Mormon or the Pearl of Great Price or different things like that. And they say, here is another testament. Now, the only testament is the testament of Jesus Christ, the New Testament. And it doesn't matter, as Paul said in Galatians 1, if we are an angel from heaven, come with any other gospel. Don't listen to him. Reject it. And here, John is saying the same thing. If you do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, you do not have God. You go by that other book, that other revelation, so-called, you go by that creed that man has come up with, that standard, that doctrine that men have created. It's no good. Methodist Book of Discipline is the same thing. Westminster Confession of Faith, the Baptist Manual. You know, men have tried to sit down and they have tried to say, here's the truth. Here's our religious beliefs. Here's our practices. Here's how we identify ourselves. Here's how we allow membership and how we kick people out of our membership. All those kinds of things. And they have violated the doctrine of Christ. They've gone beyond the doctrine of Christ. You know, anything less than the Bible is not enough. Do you agree with that? Anything less than the Bible falls short. It's not enough. Anything more than the Bible goes too far. Just as he says here, you transgress the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. You don't have the Father or the Son. So it goes too far. Anything less falls too short. Anything more goes too far. Anything other than the Bible is of men and not of God. So we are to have the Bible and the Bible alone as our rule of faith and practice because the Bible is what contains the authority of heaven. All other things are by the authority of men. And as Jesus authority was challenged. We understand he asked that question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or men? Was his authority from heaven or was it from men? And that gives us the two sources of authority. Authority must come from Christ in heaven or it is illegitimate. It is illegitimate. The Jews challenge his authority and we should not challenge the authority of Jesus Christ. He has all authority as the Son of God, as the head of the church, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Any other authority is an attempt to act as our own Lord. 
whether it's individually or collectively, we try to go by an authority other than what's in the Word of God, we are acting as our own Lord, and we are challenging the Savior, the Son of God. We will be condemned when we do such things. So we encourage you, only accept the authority of heaven. Only go by what is written in the Word of God and reject all other sources of authority. If you want to study further on this, please reach out to us and let us know. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the Word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study it will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will, Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth, Chapter 3, It is Written Again, Chapter 4, Includes Study Aids, Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. Denominationalism is in every city pretty much throughout the United States and is spread around the world, as a matter of fact. When you look at denominationalism, one of the things that you immediately recognize when you are familiar with the Word of God is it's not found in the Word of God. In other words, denominationalism is extra biblical or outside the Bible. When you look at a practice like this, you understand that by its very nature, it means to divide one from the other. Just like in our currency, we have denominations. We have tens, twenties, fives, ones, things like that. Those are denominations of our currency, and they're divided from one another, and they have different value from one another. And denominationalism in the religious realm is an inherent division in religion, and it is something that people praise, something that people like, and it's kind of odd how very often you hear about how people should be unified, and yet the very structure of their religious beliefs and practices is founded in a division and is inherent to have a division. That's part of its makeup, part of its nature, if you will. 
And denominations, of course, believe that they are a part, a subpart of the universal church. They are a denominated group out of the overall universal church. And we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But the thing we want to understand is that denominations lead men away from the Lord Jesus Christ because they are extra biblical, because they are outside the word of God. That means they did not derive their authority from the word of God, their authority to exist, their their beliefs, their practices. When you look at Luke 6, verse 46, Jesus said this, but why do you call me Lord and not do the things which I say? So they acknowledge him as Lord, that is the denominations, people in the denominations, the leaders of denominations say that Jesus is Lord and yet they don't do what he says because they are a part of a group that is not found in the Word of God. Our duty, if we are going to be pleasing to the Lord, if we're going to be a people who love the Lord and love His truth, if we're going to be those who not only call Him Lord, but do the things that He says, our duty is to resist those things which are extra biblical, those things that are outside the Word of God, outside the authority of of Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul wrote this to the churches of Galatia. He said, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what I have, what you have received, let him be accursed. So whatever Paul had not delivered to them, Paul being inspired by the Holy Spirit to deliver the truth to them, he says, look, anything that comes along that contradicts that original truth that you have received, you need to reject it. And so what we're saying now is that you and I, when we look at the religious world around us and we see those denominations around us, let's understand that we have to reject that which is not found in the original revelation of God, that which we have in the New Testament of Jesus Christ, because denominationalism is not in the Word of God. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 15. If you look at Matthew chapter 15 and verses 13 and 14, Jesus had a dispute with the religious leaders and his disciples were questioning this and asking about this. And they were wondering, you know, haven't you offended them in saying these things? Well, Jesus makes this statement in Matthew 15 verses 13 and 14. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and the blind leads the blind. Both will fall into a ditch. You see, Jesus is saying whatever has not been authorized by the Lord is going to be uprooted. Again, when you look into the Word of God, and we're going to prove this out in the studies that we plan to have with you, that you look into the Word of God you do not see denominations in the Word. So that means the Father has not planted them, but someone else has planted those things. And since someone other than the Father has planted them, they're going to be uprooted. So we have to be on the side of the Father and not participate, not be a part of those things that He did not establish, that He did not plant. So there are things in the denominational world that we want to study and we want to examine so we have a better understanding of what's right, what's wrong, what's acceptable in the sight of God. And what we're going to do in this series of studies is begin with an examination of some common beliefs and practices 
that are found among the religions of men that we see very often in our cities, our towns, and in the countryside as well. But we're going to come back in just a little bit and begin that examination on the common history, common beliefs, common practices of denominationalism. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828 465 3009. As we begin to study denominationalism, we want to get a very clear picture, first of all, of what the Bible teaches about the church. Because when we get that down, then when we look at denominationalism, we will see very clearly that the two are different and that denominationalism is extra biblical. It's outside the Bible. It doesn't have Bible authority behind it. To begin with, what we want to notice is the Bible teaches that there is one universal church. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus is speaking to Peter after Peter confessed that he believed he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord said to him this, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So you have Jesus stating, I'm going to build my church, singular, not plural, not my churches, but he's going to build his church church, the church that belongs to him, the church that belongs to Christ, or what we might say, the church of Christ. So he's talking about one universal body of believers. In fact, over in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle Paul is addressing the same subject He's talking about Christ here and what Christ has done for us and the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead. But notice what he says when he writes about this, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ is the head of the body. Now, notice what he says in Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, when he says there is one body in Ephesians 4, verse 4, back in Ephesians 1, he's already defined what that body is. When he said in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that Jesus Christ is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. So there's one body. That means there's one church. There's one head, right? And one body. That's what the word of God teaches. Now, in the word of God, it also tells us that there are local congregations, Okay. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So you have a church of God, a church belonging to God at Corinth. It's a local congregation. It's a geographical location where those who are disciples of Jesus, those who are Christians, have come together to form a congregation that they can worship together, they can work together, they can fulfill the Lord's word together, the work that he has given them to do, they can encourage one another. So you've got a local body of believers at Corinth. Same thing is true over in Philippi. If you go over to Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, and notice verse 1 here. It says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. 
So he's writing to the church at Philippi, and he says that they have saints, bishops, and deacons. Another word for bishops is shepherds or overseers. Uh, the idea is they're elders. They're overseeing the work there. They're the leaders in that congregation. They also have deacons who are special servants that have been appointed in the congregation to serve them. So you have this body of believers at Philippi. There's another one at Corinth. If you read in 1 Thessalonians, there is a church at Thessalonica. There are churches in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 1, it talks about to the churches of Galatia. So in different places, there were saints who assembled, who came together to work, worship and work together as God's people. So again, in the Bible, you have a universal church that has Jesus as the head and all saints as believers are part of that church. And then you have local churches or local congregations. And there is nothing in between. There's no organization in between. There's no organization that ties the local churches together. There's no hierarchy in there, no leadership structure, no financial ties between these churches. There's none of that going on. Each work was independent and autonomous. They fulfilled their duties as they applied the word of God and served him in their lives, in their location. So you have the universal church, the local church. Now, when you think about the universal church, you see this. You see that there is this one great big body. Now, denominationalism, in contrast to that, says that there are many different bodies that come together to make up the one universal body, which is really odd that you have one head and many bodies that come together into one big body. See, that picture does not line up with what we read about in the Word of God. We don't read about these great big bodies with leaders and, and different beliefs and different practices and different names. We don't read about that in the Word of God. And so what we see in the world around us is different than what is revealed in the Bible. So that ought to make us skeptical right away about what we see in the religious world around us. But let's think about this, that after the death of the apostles, remember that they were ordained by the Lord to go out and to teach the gospel, to reveal all truth to mankind. And so they did that. And they were very powerful leaders in the first century, going about teaching people the redeeming message of the cross of Jesus Christ. And there were false teachers who came against them and resisted them and contradicted them and attacked them. But the apostles were very effective in refuting those things. They, they weren't 100% effective because error spread in the first century. We can read about that. But they were very powerful in having an influence to help Christians as a whole to stay on track and head in the right direction and serving the Lord. However, after the death of the apostles, error spread rapidly among the churches and eventually developed into what we would now recognize as Roman Catholicism in the West. In the East, it became Orthodox type churches that we would recognize today. But in the West, where we live, it came to really be full-blown in Roman Catholicism. And churches began to make a distinction over time among the bishops that were in the churches, that they would describe some as elders and then others as bishops and elevate the bishops above the elders. Now, that's contrary to 1 Timothy, or rather Titus chapter 1, Titus 1 verse 5. Just notice this very briefly with me. It says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders 
in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. You see, he says, I want I left you in Crete to appoint elders, and then he just interchanges bishop with that word. So in the Bible, an elder and a bishop and a shepherd, by the way, they're all the same office. But early on, after the death of the apostles, men began to make a distinction between the office of an elder and the office of a bishop, and they elevated that bishop above an elder. So they had a presiding bishop. Then you might have a bishop that oversaw multiple churches, and then a bishop that oversaw a region. And eventually, of course, you had this fight in the ancient church between the bishop at Rome, the bishop at Jerusalem, bishop at Alexandria, bishop at Constantinople. And so they they began to have it out. And in the West, they eventually accepted the bishop at Rome as the universal bishop. But that took a long time to take place. In fact, it wasn't until the 7th century that he was widely accepted and acknowledged as the universal bishop. That is around 606 to 608 AD. Now, one of the things we're going to notice um, is that denominations, as we know them today, essentially sprung up out of Roman Catholicism. And the denominational movement really had a um, birth, if you will, around the time of Martin Luther. There may be some roots that go back before that, but really when it began to, when people began to break away from the dominance of Roman Catholicism and to be able to establish different religious groups that survived outside of Roman Catholicism really was in the 1500s and really spearheaded with Martin Luther and what's known as the Protestant Reformation. But when you look at Lutheran churches, they trace their roots back to Martin Luther in the early 1500s when he went and he protested against Roman Catholicism and he nailed 95 theses for debate that he wanted to debate the Pope of Rome and, um, you know, prove where these errors were taking place and show what was right. And there's a lot that he did that he recognized that this is a problem in religion, a problem in Roman Catholicism that the Bible doesn't authorize, the Bible doesn't teach. So there were a lot of things that he saw that were wrong in Roman Catholicism, but Luther didn't get everything quite right. Um, And this movement sprung up around him. And then a little bit later, you have the Presbyterian church that traces its roots into the 1500s as well under the leadership of John Calvin. In the late 1500s, it became the religion of Scotland, the official religion of Scotland. And then, of course, you have the Episcopal church when King Henry VIII wanted to get a divorce and the Pope of Rome wouldn't allow him to do it. He decided he would just start his own church, the Church of England, in the 1500s, around 1531 to 1539. And when he did that, uh, he broke away from Roman Catholicism in the United States. Of course, after the revolution and we became our own independent country, they generally became known as Episcopal churches. Uh, The Baptist Church can trace its roots essentially to the early 1600s with a man by the name of John Smith, or some people pronounce it John Smythe. Um, But he was in London, and not sure if you realize this or not, but the first mention of a Baptist church was in 1644. That's as as far as it's traced, as far as literature and writing and things like that. But So the Baptist church goes back to the 1600s. The Methodist church uh, was essentially established by John Wesley and his brother Charles in the 1700s. And then, of course, the Mormons 
come from the 1800s here in the United States. The Adventists uh, in the 1840s uh, under the leadership of William Miller Jehovah's Witnesses came about in the late 1800s and the 1870s under the leadership of Charles Taze Russell. The Pentecostal movement and Pentecostal churches really had their birth at the end of the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, they really, a lot of them sprung up out of Methodist churches and it came about really Pentecostalism it's kind of traced back to a time when they had 21 days of prayer and fasting and calling on the Holy Spirit to fill them. And so they kind of had this revival that um, resulted in excitation. Not sure exactly how else to put that, but uh, they that's where they trace their roots to, to late 1800s to 1899 or thereabouts. When you look into the history and you do some research, for instance, like there's a book called the Handbook Denominations, or Handbook of Denominations in the United States. There are over 80 major denominations in the United States. This doesn't include all the subdivisions, all the various branches within those groups. For instance, you know, there's all kinds of different Baptist churches. There's the Hard Shell Baptist or the Independent Baptist, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, uh, United Baptist, all kinds of different ones. There's different types of Methodist churches, different types of Pentecostal churches. And so we're not talking about all those different variations. We're just talking about the major religious bodies that have been identified in this handbook, there are over 80 of them. And then when you start talking about all these different kind of community churches or non-denominational churches that have sprung up, which really a lot of those are simply people who don't like the denominational structure that they were under, but they've brought all their beliefs and practices pretty much with them into that non-denominational type of church. But be that as it may, there are thousands upon thousands of different religious bodies that have divided from one another that we don't read about in the Word of God, and yet they are out there with their beliefs and practices and recruiting people into those beliefs and practices. And what we want to know, what we want to examine and study in this series, in this study today, and in the ones that we will do, Lord willing, in the future is, is that what the Word of God teaches? Is that authorized by God's Word? Is it acceptable or is it unacceptable? And of course, our position is it's unacceptable. Anything not found in the Word of God needs to be rejected. It needs to be repudiated. And we need to accept what's written in the Word of God and use it and go by it and live by it and worship according to that Word of God to have it as our sole rule of faith and practice. So we'll come back in a minute and continue in this study. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. We invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. Now we want to look at denominational beliefs and practices. And these are ones that are common among many denominations, many religious bodies in the world around us. They're not universally accepted. They're not universally practiced, but it is something that's very common. I think you'll recognize many of these things as we go through them. But again, we want to see, is this what the Bible teaches? The, these beliefs, these things that they teach, are they really according to the Word of God? Or is it something that has been accepted without critical examination? So first of all, we want to talk about inherited sin. Now, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. 
Yeah. Here's the general idea. Denominations teach that Adam committed sin in the garden, and then everyone born after Adam inherited Adam's sin nature. So when Adam committed sin, he all of a sudden had a sin nature. He was inclined to sin. And so everybody after Adam is inclined to sin, wholly inclined to evil, as some have described it. In other words, we can't help but to commit sin. It's in our very nature now. And one of the places that they'll turn to say that this is part of our nature is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. Let's read those right now. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And they'll say, see, right there, Paul says, We are children of wrath by nature. It's a part of our nature. It's how we come into this world. Well, hold that thought there just for a moment and keep your place in Ephesians 1. But let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, thinking about nature, the nature of man. In Romans chapter 1, notice verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. See, Paul's talking about homosexuality. And he says it is against nature. It's against the natural use of the woman. Men leaving the natural use of the woman and committing what's shameful with one another, burning in their lust for one another. That's men with men. He says that's against nature. Now, wait a second. If Ephesians chapter 2 is saying that our nature our inherent nature is to commit sin, how can the same writer who's inspired by the same Holy Spirit over in Romans chapter 1 say that one of those types of sins, homosexuality, is against nature? If if it is nature, then it's natural, right? If it's of our nature to commit sin, then it's of our nature to be homosexuals, and it would be natural. But Paul says in Romans 1, it's against nature. So what's he talking about in Ephesians chapter 2, that we are by nature children of wrath just as others? Well, the idea is it's an acquired nature, not we're born into this, but it's an acquired nature. So it's like someone who... um, you know, types things on a keyboard and they might type a password and they can type that password without thinking about it. Or you're traveling from your home to where you work, or maybe these days from your home to your friend's house or to a family member's house or to a place you commonly go to the grocery store or something like that. And sometimes you leave one place and you get to the other and you realize, I don't even know how I got here because you weren't thinking about it as a part of your nature, but it wasn't always a part of your nature. It's a learned habit over time. So that's what he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 2, that as we practice sin, and he's talking here specifically in Ephesians chapter 2 about Gentiles and how they were caught up in paganism and idolatry and all types of sin and wickedness. And he's saying you're by nature children of wrath just as others. You, you've acquired that. You become habituated, if you will, to committing sin. So it's just a part of you, just like there are many things in our personalities and our daily lives that we do that are by nature or by habit 
That's all that he's saying about them being children of wrath by nature. It's acquired. Now, we go back to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, because there's another argument here about inherited sin and being sinners from birth or sinners from childhood. And Psalm 51, verse 5, notice what he says here. Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So he says, you see, I was brought forth, I was born in sin. Well, David was born in Israel as well. They want to make the claim that he was born in sin means he was born a sinner. That's not what that says. He says again, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. I was brought forth in iniquity. He was brought forth in Israel. He was born into a sinful world. Doesn't mean anything more than that. You know, it doesn't say he was born guilty of sin. And remember, what David is writing about in Psalm 51 is his grief over having committed adultery with Bathsheba. And in that time of being overwhelmed with that grief, with guilt, with sorrow, with regret, he uses this language to say, you know, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was brought forth into this world of sin is really what he's getting at. But then if we go to Psalm 58, Psalm 58, a similar argument that's made sometimes in verse 3, Psalm 58, verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Well, what about that? They say men go astray from the womb. See, they're born little sinners. Well, it also says that they lie from the womb. Can newborn babies speak? Well, no, they can't speak. It takes them quite some time before they're able to speak. And this is hyperbole here. It says they go astray as soon as they're born. Not they're born astray, but they go astray. And again, this is hyperbole talking about how men are born pure, they're born innocent, but look how quickly in life we end up going into sin. We end up turning our back on God. It's not saying we're born as sinners, separated from God. It doesn't say we've inherited Adam's sin. It says we go astray. So this idea of inherited sin is not in the Word of God. In fact, if you turn to Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 and verse 20, and notice what it says here. Ezekiel chapter 18 and notice verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. You understand that I don't inherit the sin of my father, and you don't inherit the sin of your father. And if that's true, we certainly don't inherit the sin of Adam. And you run into all kinds of problems when you think about this. It says here, the soul who sins shall die. I have enough to answer for in the day of judgment. That would God be a just God for me to answer for the sins of my father and of his father and of his father going all the way back to Adam? Of course not. I, I don't answer for their sins. I'm not guilty of their sin. And here's another major issue. Jesus Christ was born of a woman. He was born of Mary. Now, the way Roman Catholics get around Jesus being born with an inherent sin nature is the Immaculate Conception and saying that Mary was born without a sin nature and therefore Jesus could be conceived and born without a sin nature. But they just, of course, made that up completely. There is a problem. If you believe in inherited sin, you have to answer the question, 
was Jesus guilty of Adam's sin? Now, you and I know the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is because no one is born guilty of Adam's sin and with a sin nature. We are all born pure and innocent in the sight of God. And there comes a point in our life when we determine and decide that we're going to turn against God. And as we live in that sin, as we make one choice after another to follow the will of the devil instead of the will of God, it becomes a habit or a nature for us in that sense. So be that as it may, inherited sin is taught among many denominations, but it is not, it is not taught in the word of God. We'll come back in a minute and we're going to look at the idea of faith only salvation. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 828- 465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Another common, very widespread belief is that faith alone saves you. The idea is they say, and it's taught, that if you just have faith in Jesus, you just accept him into your heart as your personal savior, that you're saved at that moment of belief. They may tell you, say, the sinner's prayer or something like that, which, by the way, you look into the word of God, you're not going to find the sinner's prayer anywhere in there. But this basic concept of all you need to do is have faith All you need to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're saved at that point of belief. Well, that is not taught in the Word of God. But they'll make this argument. Well, you know, John chapter 3, verse 16, one of the most famous verses of the Bible, it says all you have to do is believe to be saved. Well, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, let's understand that this is not the only thing the Bible says regarding a man's sins being forgiven or regarding salvation and having eternal life. There is much more that is said here. In John chapter 3, verse 36, it says here, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Some translations have there the the, uh, more precise translation, He who does not obey the Son shall not see life. The New American Standard Bible translates it that way because inherent in this concept of belief is obedience, or to put it another way, some people don't like the idea of obedience, not really sure why, but the idea of submission to Jesus Christ. That is inherent in the biblical concept of belief. And let me show you a thing or two uh, in the Word of God regarding that. In just a moment, let's notice here, first of all, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, I want us to notice this. Who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So, Follow the argument here. They say, John 3.16 says, the person who believes is saved, and all you have to do is believe because that's the only condition given, right? Well, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 says, we're saved by grace, and that's the only condition given. So are we saved by grace alone? See, if we're saved by grace alone, then God would save everyone. But the Bible tells us there's a broad way, there's a narrow way. There's a broad way that leads to destruction, and many go in that way. There's a narrow way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So 
unless you're going to believe in universal salvation, you need to understand there is more to salvation beyond the grace of God. In other words, there are conditions of salvation. You have to have the grace of God, and yes, you have to have belief, but there is more than that that's involved in the salvation of the soul. We're going to notice that in just a moment, but there's something else that is argued. They say, well, if you have to do anything besides believe to be saved, then you're working for your salvation. Let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Let's notice verses 28 and 29 here. This is Jesus after he had fed the 5,000. Uh, it's the next day. The people have come to find him. They're wanting more bread. So Jesus is rebuking them because they're thinking about the physical instead of the spiritual. But notice what he says here. In John 6, let's begin in verse 26, just to grab the context here. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. They Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Do you see what he just said there? He said that belief is a work. Now back up to the argument. The argument is, well, if you say anything besides belief is needed for salvation, you're saying we have to work for our salvation. But Jesus describes belief as a work. So see, that argument really doesn't hold up. And what we need to understand is in the Bible, there are different types of works, if you will. There's works of men as men try to come up with their own rules and their own standards for being saved. The Jews did that. And the Judaizing teachers in the church in the first century tried to do that. They tried to come up with their own rules and what saved them and what didn't save them. And so those were works of men. But then there's works of God. There's works of God. There are things that God says we have to do in order to be saved. And one of those things that we have to do is believe. But that's just one. It's not the sum total of what he tells us to do. But it's one of the things that he tells us we must do in order to be saved. Let's notice in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to notice verse 6 here. Galatians 5, verse 6. And notice what the Apostle Paul writes here. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. See, love is something that we are to have. And he says, faith working through love. Faith is a work. But go to 1 Peter chapter 1 with me. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 22, 1 Peter 1, verse 22, then we're going to jump over to Hebrews chapter 5. 1 Peter 1, verse 22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. He says you've purified your souls. What's another word for that? You've been forgiven. You've been saved. You've been redeemed. You've purified your souls in obeying the truth. Submitting to the truth is what he's saying. And that goes beyond just mere belief, just a mental understanding that Jesus is the Christ. Notice Ephesians, or Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9 as well. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, the Hebrew writer makes an interesting statement here. He says, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So the commands that Jesus gives, either himself personally or through his apostles, we're to obey those. If we don't obey them, we won't have salvation. 
So what's a command that he gives to us? Well, you remember in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's what Mark 16, 16 says. Now, some people want to parse that out and say, well, you know, belief is the only condition for non-salvation or for damnation. Non-belief is the condition for condemnation. Well, let me ask you something. If Jesus tells you to believe and to be baptized, to be saved, who are you or who am I to tell him, I don't have to obey what you just said. All I have to do is believe. Yeah, I know you said believe and be baptized to be saved, but I think all I need to do is believe. Is that obedience or disobedience to the command of God? That's disobedience. And he is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, not to those who argue against Jesus and what he would have us to do. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, notice another argument here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21, it says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So they'll say, well, all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord, believe and call on the name of the Lord in that belief, and you will be saved. Well, if you recall, this was part of the teaching that Peter was doing on the day of Pentecost. And if you'll just read the entire account, you're going to see that Peter told them how to call on the name of the Lord. It wasn't through something that modern men call the sinner's prayer, and they've made that up. It's through, notice, if he, or Acts chapter 2, verse 36. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucify, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, he told them near the beginning of the teaching that you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. He preaches to them about the Lord, who the Lord is, Jesus Christ. He lays out that evidence. And he declares that Jesus is the Christ. They're cut to the heart. They're convicted. They believe that. And therefore, they ask the question, well, what shall we do? And Peter says, here's what you do. Verse 38, repent and be baptized. So they have to believe. They have to repent. They have to be baptized to have their sins taken away. That's what it is to call on the name of the Lord. And let me show you another case of where that's discussed in Acts chapter 22. In Acts chapter 22, let the Bible define itself in what it's talking about calling on the name of the Lord. In Acts chapter 22, this is the account where Paul is telling about when he was on the road to Damascus and then when he got into Damascus and how that the preacher came to him and told him what he needed to do. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, notice, And now while you're waiting, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You see, just exactly what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. He said, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then in that sermon on Pentecost in Acts 2, he told them they need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And here, when the preacher came to Saul, Paul tells us that that preacher told him, Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So we call on the name of the Lord when we submit to his commands to not only believe, but to repent and to be baptized, to have our sins washed away. That is calling on the name of the Lord. So this idea that faith alone 
saves is not found in the Word of God. That's something that men has have made up in James chapter 2. James chapter 2. This is worth noting. Be sure to write this one down and go and read it if you have not been able to open up your Bible yet. Be sure to note this and come back to it. In James 2, verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Hey, when it says a man is justified by works, he is not talking about works of men. Obviously, the Bible says if we try to work to earn something from God, put God in our debt, we can't do that. But we can do the things that God commands us to do, like believe, as we've already studied, belief is a work. And so we do what God commands us. That's the works that he's talking about here. And he says, a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Men declare, the denominations proclaim, you're saved by faith only. The Bible says it's not by faith only. So think about that and study on that and understand what you hear in the world around you is not what the Word of God teaches. And we're going to come back in a moment and look at this concept of once saved, always saved. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Another very common teaching found among denominations is once you're saved, you're always saved. And it kind of goes like this. You believe and you're saved. That faith only salvation. And then once you're saved, once your sins are forgiven, you can never lose that salvation no matter what. The concept is that, you know, if you're saved, you won't sin. But if you do sin, it's not going to be held against you. So you can go out. And in theory, commit murder or rape, adultery, get drunk. You can steal from people. You could be a a terrible person in many different ways and not lose your salvation. You would still be able to go to heaven because once you're saved, you're always saved. Sometimes this is described as perseverance of the saints. Now, let's notice one of the places in the Bible that's used to justify this doctrine, if you will. In John chapter 10, John chapter 10, let's notice verse 28 here. It says, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. They'll say, see, Jesus said that I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. That's it. You have eternal life, you always have it doesn't matter what happens from that point on. Well, let's read a couple of other verses here. Verse 27, John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and follow me. Okay, that's the conditions. They hear him, they're listening to Jesus, and they are following him. And as long as they're hearing, and as long as they're following, yes, it's absolutely true, they will not perish. But what happens if they stop listening to Jesus, they stop following Jesus? And notice what it also says, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. In other words, As we live faithfully for Jesus Christ, no one can rob us of that salvation. No one can snatch us away from the Lord. Not even the devil himself can take us away from Jesus. As we hear him, 
as we follow him, as we're doing his will, as we are a faithful sheep, a faithful disciple of the Lord, we will never perish. But what happens when we turn our back on the Lord? What happens when we stop listening to him and stop doing his will in our lives? When we turn back to a life of sin, what happens then? Well, the obvious answer to that is we are separated from him because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God cannot have fellowship with sin. And when you break fellowship with God, that means you are lost. And so... Using John 10, 28 to justify once saved, always saved is a perversion of the scripture. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, or rather chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, let's just notice this real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. What's Paul describing there? He's saying there will come a time when there are people among God's people, when there are Christians, who stop listening to truth. They turn their ears away from the truth. They turn their ears away from the Lord. And they go after false teaching. Those people are lost. Though they were once saved, they were lost. And what about in John chapter 6? John chapter 6. You remember what happened when Jesus was teaching the people in John chapter 6? He said some things that was too hard for the people to take. And so in John 6 verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. You see, people can stop listening to Jesus and they can stop following him. When they do that, they are lost. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. This is another passage where people turn and, and they'll read. And they'll say, we'll see right here. It says we can't lose our salvation. Romans 8 verse 31 to begin with. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, first thing I would like you to think about is that he is giving assurance to the child of God that your relationship with the Lord is intact and no one can take that away from you. When he talks there about the principalities, the powers, you know, angels, none of those things can take that relationship away, can steal that relationship and spoil it. Can't be done. He says that distress, persecution, neck and peril, sword, so difficult circumstances, hardships in life cannot separate you from the love of the Lord. He does not say in this list of things, sin, does he? He doesn't say, shall sin separate us from the love of Christ? Because the answer to that is yes. We commit sin. We go and we live a life of rebellion toward God. Yes, that does separate us from the Lord. So let's understand he's not talking about us making a choice to turn away from God. He's talking about those pressures, those powers that come against you. They cannot separate you from God. Now, if you give in to temptation, you give in to Satan, you turn your back on the Lord. Yes, you can be separated from the Lord. Now, notice Galatians chapter 5. 
Galatians chapter 5, because there are people who have not been shown this passage, but it states very clearly that people can fall from grace. Galatians 5, notice verse 4. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. And what he's talking about in the context there is the Judaizing teachers binding circumcision, binding the law of Moses on the Gentiles. And he says, look, you try to do that. You become estranged from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Not you will or you could, but you have fallen from grace. So you see, people can lose their salvation. Galatians 5 verse 4 explicitly states that some had fallen from grace. So yes, there's nothing outside of me, nothing outside of you, that once you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that can force you away from Christ. But we can voluntarily decide we're going to follow a different path. We're going to turn our back on the Lord. We're going to live a life of selfishness and sin. We can decide that, and that separates us from the Lord. But there's another argument in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Let's notice this. As we're thinking about this idea of once saved, always saved, does the Bible teach once saved, always saved? And the resounding answer is no. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches we can be separated from the Lord if we turn to sin. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. We need to read this context here. What is it that John is talking about? You know, people very often and denominations are very famous and the leaders, the teachers are very famous for this, going in and plucking a a verse out and having it stand on its own and giving it a meaning that's not in the context. So let's notice 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. So the person who commits sin, he's writing to Christians here. You just back up in the book and you read that he's writing to people who have believed, people have obeyed, people who are children of God. He says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. So as we are in Christ, we're serving him, we're doing his will, there's no sin. We're pure. Whoever abides in him does not sin. You follow the will of God, you don't sin. It's inherent in the very nature of being obedient to the Lord. That means you're not giving in to temptation, you're not giving in to the devil. Whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. You're behaving like the world, you're you're living unrighteously. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous, you practice righteousness, that's your way of life, then you are righteous. You're not a sinner, you're righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever, the devil, whoever has been born of God, does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And one of the keys here is in verse 7, where he talks about practicing righteousness. You've been born of God, you practice righteousness, you live in that way, and you're pure. You're free from sin. You don't commit sin when you live in righteousness. But if you turn from that, as he talked about before, you commit lawlessness, then you're in sin. You are not doing the will of God. Remember 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, very important in the context of this letter and what he's teaching here, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. 
You know, from time to time, we all commit sin. And he's pointing out, look, the child of God can sin. Now, he doesn't tell us in chapter 1 that we sin, and if we say we do not sin, we're a liar, and then come back in chapter 3 and say, you can't commit sin at all, ever. No, in chapter 3, he's talking about a way of life, a practice. A, a way that you live day by day. A child of God who's committed to him is living day by day a righteous life because they're following the will of God, because they have Christ abiding them in, in them and they are abiding in Christ. But if you turn your back on that, you commit sin, then that's not the way that you are. You're following it after the devil. So there's a way of life following the Lord and a way of life in following the devil. And the child of God can turn and become a child of the devil. So this idea of once saved, always saved is not in the word of God. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Let's wrap up our study now by thinking about this, that there are some things that denominations have in common. Um, They very often have a common history. They spring out of common roots, or they can trace their roots to a common movement, mainly the Protestant Reformation movement. They have some common beliefs and common practices, and we just touched on a few of those beliefs in this study together. And those beliefs are not found in the Word of God. Those things that they teach are not rooted in biblical doctrine, just like their organizations and the names that they have and different things like that. Those are not rooted in the Word of God. And so we shouldn't be surprised if the very foundation of those organizations the very organization and, and, and how they're made up is not in the Bible, then we shouldn't be surprised that what they teach very often is not in the Bible. Denominations dominate our land. And it's sad because there are people caught up in these religions of men that don't even realize that what they're doing is not authorized in the Word of God. And instead of living in fellowship with the Lord, they're living in rebellion toward the Lord. Because Jesus, we understand, is the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. In Matthew chapter 28, Verse 18, Jesus explicitly states, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And when we acknowledge him as Lord, but don't do the things that he says, that means we are in rebellion toward our Lord instead of being in submission to him and having a good and healthy relationship with our Lord leading unto an eternal home in heaven. So we encourage you, take the things that we've studied here and examine the Word of God. Do you see what you have been taught or do you see the group of which you are part in the Word of God? If not, then won't you have that devotion to the Lord that would cause you to turn away from those things that are not authorized and turn to Him. We would love to be able to sit down with you and study with you 
and further investigate what does the Word of God say that we are to do to be pleasing and acceptable in His sight. So please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His saving plan for man, and the church Jesus established? Please let us know, and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail, or to be added to the church's quarterly mail-out of the bulletin, or a copy of the outlines of our lessons. Call us at 828 465 30 Again, that number is 828-465-3009. If there is no answer, please leave a message and we will fulfill your request or return your call as soon as possible. You may also go to wordandsword.com for many more Bible study materials, including past episodes of this TV program, or scroll down on the homepage to take a quiz and test your Bible knowledge. That's again, wordandsword.com. Visit our Facebook page, facebook.com slash wordandsword. Leave a comment about the program or ask a Bible question. Again, that's facebook.com slash wordandsword. If you live within driving distance, we invite you to join us in one of our services and meet us in person. We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. Our classes are for those of all ages. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Our contact information once more. The phone, 828-465-3009. Email, contact at wordandsword.com. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash wordandsword. Our website is wordandsword.com. And our address is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thou my buckler, my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, and thou my high tower. Come raise me heavenward, O Riches I heed not, nor man's empty prayer.